I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I'm telling you, if that doesn't light you on fire, I trust in God. I, I heard it in the testimonies today. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and I answered. How many can claim that today? I sought the Lord, and he heard my prayer, and he answered. Oh, claim that today, church. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. God is there. God is real. Sanctification. Setting ourselves aside. And this is, this is kind of a twist. I hadn't put these words together, and it was in our announcements today. Setting ourselves aside for something by gathering together. That's what we do. We come together here. We're setting ourselves aside for the use of God. We're preparing ourselves for the use of God. Yes, that's, that's part of our sanctification. Yeah, it, it takes me getting alone with God, but me getting with my brothers and sisters and, and the sharing of the faith, you know, the iron sharpeneth iron. You know, I, I get a blessing when I hear people, when, when they talk about how they've got their prayers answered. When I hear faith and I hear God's rewards, prayer changes things. I'm going to carry on the commercial for the, our, our Friday night prayer meeting. Let that be a time you prepare for even now. I, I know I got a message. I got, a, got the sign on the marquee that sa says what I'm talking about. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't push that a little further. Between now and next Friday, sanctification, what does that mean to you? What are we doing with it? What are we doing to draw ourselves closer to God? Not closer to the pastors or closer to the musicians or the teachers or closer to these red chairs or the church congregation. Closer to God because that's something that you can't substitute. We can get up here and hoop and holler and make a lot of noise singing and, and, and the preacher can get up here and say some loud, loud, say some profound things, but it's drawing closer to God and sanctifying and, and, and if you don't know what that means, you know, look that up. Look up the word sanctify. Do a concordance search and look through and see where, what it meant to be sanctified to God, set apart. Because that's, that's important. Because those, those are the things as flesh and human beings we can lose sight of real easy. Kevin, you, you nailed it with your testimony. I appreciate that. Treat everyone like, like it was you. Because people need to hear about Jesus. You know, people don't need to hear me. No, they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth that I have found. And, and I find that as, as, as a way to share with people. Some people say, I can't talk to people. I mean, I'm on, you know, inviting a coworker. That's awesome. You know, and, and it's as simple as saying, come find what I've found. And then it's revisiting in ourselves what we found. A sign on the marquee says, a spirit of giving. And I want to amend to that. A spirit of giving and our relationship with God and wealth. And this is a, a fun topic. Some, some, some preachers may like to preach on it, some don't. I have a personal, I, I don't like to ask for money. I don't. But I know it's needful. And I am so blessed to know that even though I've never, I can ask God. And when I need to ask for something, I can ask for it. And God's been there for as long as I can remember. I, I play in the back of my mind, actually I put it in the front of my mind, to remember the things that, that God has done for me. Even in, in, in times where things didn't make any sense, where I don't know where the next step's supposed to be, God orders my steps. As David said, the, the word is a, a light into my feet and a lamp into my path. God's been there for that, and that's awesome. And, to, and to, those are the things we have to revisit. And... I, I could give this the title Tithes and Offerings, but that really doesn't do it justice. Tithes and Offering is kind of our code word for putting money in the box. And having a spirit of giving and, and our relationship with God and our relationship with our wealth is, is much bigger than the phrase Tithes and Offerings. Now, we need money to do things. The light's got to be turned on. You know, the air conditioning, we, we kind of enjoy that when we come in here for a service. We, we like to have the sound system and all that. You know, we've got ministers that are paid, ministers that aren't paid, 
and those are things that, that, that are important. We've got things going on uh, in other countries that are, are, are tra- where our pastors are traveling. That, that takes money. But it's bigger than that. That's just a small necessary piece that has to be done. Sometimes we've got to say, you know, we've got to put the big bubble uh, thermometer chart up and say, hey, you know what, we, we're trying to do something. Those are necessary. That's not exactly what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about here, the heart, the soul. Where, where are we at with our walk with God? And how do we view our wealth? And I know that can be touchy. So we're going to stop and pray over this now. God Almighty, I ask that you would take me out of the way. Bless the words, bless the understanding, bless the congregation, bless those that hear this to know more clearly what you desire of them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our offering. One of the first things we see in the Bible of an offering is Cain and Abel. You got two men that brought an offering. For one it was accepted and one it wasn't. And a lot of scholars, you know, put a lot into this, but I, I just take the simplicity. And it's a, just for your notes, it's Genesis 4. Um, but Abel brought of the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. He brought the first fruits. He brought what was first. And it said Cain just brought of the ground. And they could say, well, one was meat and one was of the ground. I think what's more significant is that Abel brought the firstling. He brought the first fruit. He brought what was first. And then that's, that's the point. What do we bring to God? And, and again, if we're talking about tithes and offerings, we, you know, in that simplicity, I think it's important that if, if, if we're honoring God in that piece, that you know, if you make a budget, well, that should go off. The, be, it should be the first thing there. And I believe God honors that. And not to make it, oh, all right, this is the first bill I've got to pay. I mean, it's, it's good to treat it that way, but but it's good to pray about it. Sometimes it's easy to, to take that and put it, and, the, and those that do, it's easy to put it there and forget about it and just say, well, this is my tithe. But do we stop and pray about it? Even if that not, dollar amount's not going to change, you know, like this is how much I made and then this is how much I can give. Do we pray about that? And not just for the obvious of, all right, how much should I give or not give or can I afford this, but... Where's my heart to this? Am I giving, as, as Scripture says, a cheerful giver? Am I giving out of my heart to God? Because it's easy to look and say, oh, the church, they, I don't want to give the church my money. But the church is looking, is using it for, for God's will. But it's, it's not about, like I said, paying a bill. It's not about just writing a check. It's about, you know, where, where's my heart? Where, where, where am I, where, where am I? Where's my soul on this thing? In Matthew 5, 20, actually, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans 12, 1, you know, talk, Scripture kind of changes things. Paul admonishes, admonishes us and said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So here he's saying you present your bodies. That's everything. Because when we're talking about giving to God, in, in the Old Testament, they had to give of the things that they had. Sometimes it could be hard money, but it was the the livestock they raised. It was the the fruit of the ground, and, and, and even in those instances, they were to bring the first fruits of whatever it was they got. But here, it says a living sacrifice. That's me. It's everything I've got. And, and really, if I look at it like I'm a farmer, and, and I'm giving of all that, that's that's some hard work. I mean, if you're a farmer, you're, you're, it, it's, you know, it, there, there isn't a time clock if you're a farmer. There isn't, you're not punching the clock and saying, this is my start time and this is my stop time. When an animal needs your help, you go out and take care of it. When it's time to, to bring in the harvest, you're going from sun up to sundown. Even now, you, you see the fields at, at night, you know, in the, in the end of the year, they got big old lights on those combines. They're, they're racing the clock. They're racing the weather. They're racing the elements of the earth to, to get that out of the field before it gets wet and they have to wait and then it goes bad and they lose part of their yield. It's, it's, it's their life. You know, it's, it's easy. Now we, we punch the clock and, and do our nine to five job and collect our paycheck. And it's good to kind of look at it on the farmer mentality. You know, that's their life. And, and, and what is our life? I mean, the blessing now is I have a nine to five job. Kind of like it. 
get home. My job's done. I, I, when, I, when, I, when I worked as a service technician, I, I don't do it anymore. When I worked as a service technician, I had my van. I would get out of my van, close the door, hang the keys up in the house, and then my job was done. But that, the blessing is, you know, with that, it, we're, we're, we're free to, to, to go down the avenue of other areas of our lives. You know, what has God given us? What are, talents has God given us? What, what, is, what has God given us to do that we can do that we maybe don't even realize? You know, as simple as, as, as taking time to pray and taking time to, to bring other, make an intercessory, <coughs> excuse me, intercessory prayer before God. Time to learn a musical instrument. Time to study the word. Time to do, what has God given you to do? Time to help people out. Make a meal for somebody. Maybe go help somebody else in their, you know, take care of projects in their home. And these are all things that we do with the body of Christ. And so it goes far beyond a, a, a number on, on, a, on a check. It's our life, a living sacrifice. And Jesus made an importance on, on a gift being brought and how we did it. This is all matters of the heart. In Matthew 5, 23, it says, Therefore, I br- if, they, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou remember that their brother has ought against thee, and I didn't write all that and give it to Pete, but I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase this, cable, but it, this parable. It says, If your brother hath ought against you, you leave your gift at the altar. It doesn't say if I have ought against my brother. It says if my brother have ought against me. That makes it a lot harder. Ought, anything. Something. That means there's something there. And you know what? It may even be something that you don't think you did wrong. And maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe, maybe the brother perceived that you did something wrong. It doesn't matter. It says your brother have ought against you. And that's how important God, God makes this. You know, the, the first and great commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second one? Love thy neighbor as yourself. So, so in all this hang the law and the prophets. You get that right, you get everything else right. Love God with everything and love others. You get that right. And, that, and that's the importance he places that the Lord placed on this when he talked about bringing a gift to God. Our tithe, our offering, our gift, our, our talents, the things that we do, you know, if I'm bringing this before God, well, what about my brother or sister that, that I might have offended? That's more important. Let's skip down to Matthew 23, 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. Our offering to God. It's, it's important that we get it all in the right order. Look at the Ten Commandments. So ten of them. Out of the Ten Commandments, the first four are, Thou shalt lo- have no other gods before me. So it's about God. Thou shalt make unto thee no graven images. It's about God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain and remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's the first four. Those are about God. Now, the last six, honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet. Those last six are involving other people. And that's how, and, and I hang that all off of, the, if they bring to the gift to the altar, remember that thy brother have ought against thee. That's how important our relationship with the Lord is and how important our relationship with each other is compared to our offering. And again, I, I title this our relationship with God and wealth. I haven't got to the wealth part yet. Our relationship with God. How many of you like having money? Anybody don't like having money? And anybody, anybody ever contemplated what it would be like if you won a million dollars? Any ever, anybody ever thought a billion dollars? Anybody ever thought, that's crazy, I would never want that? I, I, honestly, that's the thought I have. If I had a billion dollars, that would change my life in ways that I would not, have, not want it to be changed. And that's a hard pill to swallow. I, if I had a million dollars, okay, that's, that's good retirement money. If I had $10 million, now, I'm, now my money is managing me. 
or I am paying people to manage my money. Now, if somehow I got it, I'd have to seek God real hard and figure out what to do with it. But, you know, that type of wealth, that changes a man's life. It changes a woman's life. And, and, and it could be a different amount for different people, you know. You know, you get what you want. You know, I've seen people who get inheritance, and it changes the way they are. Changes changes their whole demeanor and their attitude. You know, we've seen, you know, if you've watched any news, you've seen, you know, people that have won the lottery, and very few of them manage it well. And they get handed that amount of money, and they either go blow it, they get arrested, they do evil things with it, and, and it drives them deeper into sin, or they wind up in more debt than they had to begin with, you know, than the money that they, they received. Now, this isn't me preaching the evils of money, because it says the love of money is the root of all evil. I, I'm just painting the picture because, you know, you know, how do we vision wealth? How do we see that? And how do we put God in that picture? So man has a responsibility to God with his wealth. And you think about it. God gave us the wealth. God gave us the ability. You see people out there that say that I'm a self-made man. No, you're not. You, you may have taken those things that God gave you and developed it, but you did not make yourself. You didn't take the dust of the earth and breathe life into it. You, know, you didn't breathe life, in, breathe life into yourself. No, it takes some work. It ta- you know, the, anyone, I, I see, you know, Kevin, you've got a craft. Ken, you've got a craft. Um, a lot of people have things that they do with their hands, jobs. Um, it, takes, it takes time and effort to do that. You, you, you just don't get there overnight. You have to work at it. You know, you, you don't just take a couple cans of paint and mix it together and get what you want to put on that boat, do you, Ken? No, you had to do a lot of learning. Kevin, you had to learn a lot of stuff to do your do your trade. And there's many I could I could I could I could call out on that. But what has God given you? What has God given me? It's and then on top of that, now how do I give thanks back to God with? what I have. Because God gave me the ability to work. God gave me the ability to earn a paycheck. God, And all of us are in different places, but God gives us what we have. I'm going to switch gears to Ecclesiastes 3 verse 9. And this is a little more on the, on man needs to work. Uh, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail with which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but a man to rejoice and do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it. That men should fear before him. That which has been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. That which is to be hath already seen, and God requireth which is past. So God requires of us what we have done and what we're doing. God God had, wants it, his benefit from it. He requires it of us. And it, and it says it's good for us to work. It's good for us to, to reap our reward and to enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruit of your labor, but knowing full well it's God's and, and giving thanks to God and giving back to God. Man being intended to work. You, you ever notice somebody retiring, and sometimes they're not a lot, not around very long after they retire. Man is meant to work. Without something to do, you know, you we 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 think of you know retiring and getting a rest. Well, that that's when we get ourselves into trouble. Now, I'm not saying no one should retire from their job. I mean, I'm looking forward to to, to having a retirement. I know Pastor Lee just retired. But I'm talking about having a purpose in life, asking God what it is that, that, that he would have you to do. Because when you have a purpose in life, th- then you have something to live for. 
Um, my grandmother, my grandfather, I had an uncle who was Down syndrome. So they all had a purpose, even after retirement, to take care of each other. Um, my grandfather did many things. Um, after he retired from what he did, he still lived quite a long life. You know, and, and he had projects that he did. He, you know, they'd taken care of his house. He had a 10-acre um, piece of land. He had it, gardens on it. He was part of um, part of a project to help um, set up a home for, for those that uh, needed help, for those that are physically and mental ch- mentally challenged. So he kept himself busy with that. And, and my grandmother was busy by his side and taking care of my uncle. And... When my grandfather, when finally his health got the best of him, and he did pass, and my uncle had passed, and then my grandmother lost her purpose. And I don't call that a tragedy. I call that, you know, I mean, no one likes death. No one likes to lose a loved one. But that's our natural course. When, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And she had a purpose in life, and it was to take care of my grandfather and my uncle. My uncle lived at home for most of his life because he was mentally challenged. But once they were both gone... That, that her, her, her challenge, the things that she did in life were gone. And she was not with us that long after. She had passed not that long after. And that's how we are in life. We have to have a purpose. And then even those of us that are young and our health is still good, if we don't have a purpose, we still die inside if we don't have a purpose. And you, you ever kind of cry it out and say, what am I supposed to do, God? You, you ever felt that way? It's good to cry out. It's good to ask God. It's good to to yield. It's good to, as a song said, I trust in God. Because God's faithful. He'll give us something. And and you have to seek him. Um, Our relationship to wealth. A little more reading here. I know it's a lot. But Ecclesiastes, it's it's, uh, Solomon, his wisdom. He was given more wisdom than than anyone around. God had given him the wisdom to, to guide his people. And Solomon talks about the wisdom that he gained, that, that he was given, and even the, the downfalls of the wisdom because he went out and tried everything. He went out and did a lot of things and found himself, in, 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 and he gained the wisdom, and, and he put it in a book for us to read, which is awesome. You know, the, the things of, of man, the things of life, the things of finance, the things of emotions, things, all, all kinds of different things. You look through Ecclesiastic, there's so much in there. But here in uh, five, chapter 5, verse 8, it says, If thou seest the oppression of the poor and the violent preferring judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. He that loseth, loseth. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor that loveth abundance with increase, this also is vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them, and what good is there the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? You know, you, you get more money, you got to pay more people, and you got more people around to partake in your goods, and you just get to look at it. It's all vanity, just to gain more money. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. The sleep of a laboring man, whether he little or much. If you're, if you're laboring, if you're doing what you're supposed to, maybe you have a little to eat, maybe you have a lot to eat. But a laboring man, God will give you rest. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You lay awake wondering, all right, am I going to lose my money and how am I going to make more money? This, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travails, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. Riches by, perish by evil travail. The more money you get, the more someone's looking to take your money. The more the riches you get, the more someone's out to get what you got. As he came forth from the mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor but he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil that in all points as he came, so shall he go. What profit hath he that hath labor for the wind? And his days also he eateth darkness, 
and he hath much sorrow, wrath with his sickness. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man knoweth also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. So this is about our relationship to wealth. Not about having wealth, not about wanting wealth. I mean, all of us would like to have a little more money. But it's about our relationship. Is it about God gave me this ability, and I'm going to use it to my fullness? Because there's a reason why the, 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 a man in his labor has a good sleep. Because you worked hard. And how many out went out and worked in the yard and you slept better than you ever had when you went out and did some physical labor? Where's you out? But you've done something good. You've done something productive. And God gives you sweet rest. A relationship. And I could preach against having money, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's about... How do we view God and how do we view our money? And we're intended to work. Adam was placed in the garden to tend it. He had something to do. Problem came when he sinned and labor became a whole lot harder. His labor was increased. He actually had to work really hard to get it done by the sweat of his brow. Things changed. But still, we're intended to work. little more on how we treat our wealth. Um, parable of the, there's a parable in Luke chapter 12. And, and a man had, I forgot it, and one, no, that's not where I'm at. That's a different one. So, did I write it in here? And one of the companies said unto him, this is Luke twelve thirteen, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and be aware of covetous, covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things that he possesses, possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, and before I go into that, how, how many have had to deal with inheritance? It, it can be ugly. It can be sweet, it can be ugly. You know, you, you find out how much people value money over family in, at that time. And, and I wouldn't pray that, that on anybody. But that, that's, that's when you start putting money in front, front of people and start, people start going for that, that tells you who people are. It tells you where you're at. I mean, I, I had to examine myself whenever my parents passed and, and my grandparents passed and I looked at the inheritance. That caused me to examine myself, and there really was there was controversy on in the family on who got what. I wasn't happy with what I got from my grandpa, but you know what? I had to examine myself with God. I had to say, God, show me what's what's right. And you know, at that point, it didn't matter. It didn't matter because if I were to go back and contest, I mean, there's a time to you know make the rights right and and, and call out what's wrong, but there's a time to say, you know what? My family's worth more than causing a ruckus over a few earthly items. It's mine. I have a right to it. Grandpa told me I could have that. But it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, my relationship with the rest of the family is much more important. My, my walk with God is more important. What does that do to your testimony? When, 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 you know, it's one thing when it's cut and dry and you can contest something. But if it's just about I deserve more. That, that's a prayerful thing. And I can't tell you exactly how to handle every situation. But that's something that's got to be prayerfully done. Because, you know, where, where's your testimony is, is of godliness if, if, you know, if you jump into the fray with someone who's all about money? And you know what? When, when you yield to that, when God shows you that's the direction to go, God will bless you. It may not be in that situation, but he'll bless you. God will give you what you need. Um, back to Luke 12. And he spake a parable unto them, the ground of a certain man brought forth plentiful. And he brought, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? 
And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And will say to my soul, soul thou, ha- soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who's, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's the key. You know, some might take that and say, oh, I can't save for retirement. No, that's not what it says. It says, so is, someone, is, a, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If I'm laying up treasure in my retirement, it's still because I want to do God's will even after, after the nine to five job is gone, after the, the steady paycheck rolls in, stops rolling in. It's about trusting in God and being rich toward God. What does that mean, rich towards God? You know, laying up treasures in heaven. So that leads to a question, what are you working for? What am I working for? If you're working a, a job, what, what are you laboring for? Uh, Haggai 1.6. And the little background is, you know, they were even... It was it about it was about whether to to, to build temp, the temple to to put into the house of God or to have wealth for for themselves, and it says you own much and bring in little, ye eat but you have not enough, ye drink but ye are not filled with drink, you clothe but there is none warm, and he that earneth wages earneth wages to put in a bag with holes. And I'm going to bring us right into 1 John 2:15 and 16. It says, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If the love, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world." So again, it's not about what we have, what we don't have. It's about where's my heart towards it. And we, if we find ourselves where, you know, I'm never satisfied. I, I go buy this. I get the newest TV. I get the get this new car. I get, you know, facelift for the home. You know, get the, you know, I get the, build my dream kitchen or, or you know, put a new deck on the house to have, you know, this, you know, I, I see people, they, they, they build their retirement homes and don't live to use them very long. Now, am I saying that's wrong? No, I'm saying be rich towards God. You know, there's a balance to be had. And there's a, the balance is giving thanks to God and giving back to God. And you give back to God, I've heard it said over and over, over you can't outgive God. You can't do it. When, 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 you, when you put your heart towards God to do the things God's called you to do, God blesses you. And you may not, may not be keeping up with the Joneses. You may not have all the, uh, the, the latest and greatest. But you know what? God gives you what you need. And God gives you the peace to enjoy what you have. And God gives you, you know, a joy in your life that, 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 that stuff can't get. You know, I, I see a lot of people that get a lot of stuff. And they're not happy. So they get something else. And they're still not happy. Then they look at the debt they've got and they're really not happy. <laughs> So what are you laboring for? Where's your love? So a giving attitude. Again, I'll refer to the title again. It's a spirit of giving, a relationship with God and wealth. Our relationship with God and our relationship with our wealth. It has to be a healthy balance there. Having a giving attitude. Matthew 6 is where we get the Lord's Prayer from, but before that it talks about... How we, how we give. Matthew 6, 1 says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of, of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, sound not the trumpet before thee as the hypocrite do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So if you're looking for the glory of men, that's your reward. 
But when they doest thy alm, alms, let not thy hand, right hand, left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Thine alms, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which is seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And Jesus spoke those words. You know, if, if we take the time to to give in a way that helps, and and we talk about giving and in, in, in putting in our box, and that's that's one form of giving. And in, in this particular church, you know, we don't. We, have, we don't normally pass a plate. Not that there's anything wrong with passing a plate. That's just not how we have chosen to do it. We choose to let it be private. You know, some churches have a box where you come up and you put it in front. Some have pass the plate. You know, we choose to do it with a box in the back. And, there, and there's online giving. It's so easy just to, from the privacy of your home to, to do what God's laid on your heart. Just commercial, if you look on the bottom of our, our sign out there, it's imcfc.org. It's real easy to get to. And if that's something God's laid on your heart, and again, I don't like asking for money. This is about an obligation. This is what God set up. I didn't set this up. Even throughout the Old Testament, there was a tithing. And the tithe, you know, it became, you know, over time more of a tax. Israel, you know, Israel had a, had their tithe. They, they collected it religiously, and they made sure you, you paid that. You know, we, we, we don't live under Jewish law. We're under the grace of God. But that the, the same God that, that gave the law gave gives us his spirit and tells us what we need to do with what we have. So imcfc.org. No. And again, I, I put this in my, in my notes twice, but I'll come back to it again, Luke eleven forty two. But woe unto you Pharisees, tithe mint and rue and manner of herbs and pass judgment and the, lo- and the love of God. These ought you have to have done and not leave the other undone. Again, I, I don't want to make such a big deal about giving in the offering. It's important. God gives us the ability to do it. It's, it's one of our ways of giving back. But it, it's more than that because it, it's about... What do we do for our fellow man? How do we help someone out? Because it's easy to, now I'll, I'll, I'll flip the coin over. It's easy to take my check and drop it in the box and say, oh, I'm done. I don't have to get, give God anymore. And that's where it gets dangerous. Because, yeah, we have our wealth. But what else do we have in our wealth? Because God gives us the ability to do work. That, and, and as I say, ability to do work, that doesn't mean just our nine-to-five job. He gives us the ability to do things to bless him. He gives us the ability to bless each other. Love thy neighbor as thyself. God made an importance on that. So we ask a qu- sometimes we ask the question, okay, how much do I give? In the Old Testament, it was pretty much standard. It was a tithe. There was other offerings, but that was the Old Testament law. I think it's a pretty good benchmark. But New Testament-wise, there really isn't a number to tell us. Paul admonishes to live, that we are a living sacrifice. So really, it's all God's. But at the end of the day, it's got to be something, you know, if you're an individual, you, you, you sit down and say, this is, this is what I have, and you put it before God, and you ask God what to do with it. Because God will honor that. God won't give you more than you can bear. But if, if I give a number to it, one, I don't have the number, but if I did, I'd be, I might be letting somebody off the hook. Everyone knows what, you know, when you sit down and look at your budget, when you look at what I look at your time, you look at what you can offer to God, you look at your talents. And I'll throw this out there too. You look at you look at the abilities you have in your life. And you may have, well, this is something I can kind of do. Can you started off your boat business washing washing boats, right? With your side jobs. What would have happened if you, if you never developed that talent, if you didn't study and learn about the paints and learn about how to put the fleck in there and how to make sure the boat's going to float and keep the water out of it? What, what would happen? You would starve. You would, not have a, you would not have a business. You know, he had to develop that talent. Now, that's for a business purpose and fed his family and, and, and done, has done well with it. But now let's go to the talents that God gives us day to day. Bill, if you don't put time in on your horn, what happens? <laughs> yep. After a day, if, if I don't play my guitar, 
for a day, I know it. If I don't do it for three days, everyone else knows it. So those are things, that, my point is, that those are things that have to be worked on. Those things have to be nourished. Those things have to be developed. So the question is, what's in your life that God's got for you now? We're still talking about our wealth. Wealth can be measured by the talents we have. Wealth, because, you know, if, if, if you know, if, if you don't have the ability to do something, well, you can't, you can't make money with it. You can't bless somebody with it. But if you have the ability to cook and you know how God has given you, well, you, you find more recipes. You, you learn and you gain understanding on what your different foods do. Uh, if it's working on cars, if that's something that blesses you, you know. Sometimes you got to read a manual. You can't just wing it. You know, you can't just take a wrench and say, I think I'm going to take that bolt out. That's not going to go very far. And, and there are many different things. Studying the Word of God, being able to teach, you know, that doesn't come naturally. Now, people have a tendency, people have natural ability to teach. But no matter what it is, you have to develop a craft. Uh, that's something we do with our preaching team or teaching team. You know, we. We encourage you. You develop the craft. You do, you learn how to teach. You learn how to use voice inflection. You use how to how to to speak properly. You you learn how to make eye contact. You learn how to read a, read a room. That's something you do if you're going to teach or preach. If you're going, and then on top of that, now you have to learn the Word of God. You have to understand what it is you're teaching. So I bring this around to, you know, in, in whatever area that, that that God's giving you to serve. Now I'm going to kind of pull back into another commercial for our CFCMI 101. That's the, the basics of our, you know, what we're about as Christians, what we're about as a ministry. And part of that CFCMI 101, the very basic core is service. What are we doing? What, what, what am I doing for God? What does God want me to do for him? What does God want me to do in, in, in this ministry? In this organization, you know, we're just a very small part of the body of Christ, but we're part of the body of Christ. And we have a responsibility to each other, to the community around us. You know, what is, what is God wanting you to do in that? How do we develop that? Because that's part of your giving back to God. That's part of you, you say, letting God use you. So I'll hit that one more time. What, what are you doing for God? And what are you doing within the organization? Because an organization can do a whole lot more than one person can do. An organization can do a whole lot more. And that's why we do what we do. Plus, we can draw on the strength of each other. If I'm out on my own, I don't have the strength to draw off anybody else. But I, if I'm here, if I'm here with my brothers and sisters and I work with a group and a team, there's a lot to do. So the question, what are you working for? And I'll follow up back with the giving attitude. A couple of scriptures I'll just give you to throw in your notes. Matthew 6, 19. This is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters. And then in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, we're not going to go to those. But in Acts chapter 2, we find were the early church. They had all things in common. They sold possessions. They made sure everything, everyone had what they needed. And they took care of each other. And then Paul in, in, in Acts chapter 4 commended the church for what? For taking care of him, taking care of those that Paul was, was mentoring and teaching ministers. You know, he, he couldn't he was in prison. He couldn't get out and do what he had to do. He was teaching others. Even, even when he was in prison, he was writing letters and the care of the church for those ministers. Paul commends them for that. And we could hear that as, oh, he's asking for money. No. That, that, that's what needs to happen, because how many of you want pastors that have to work a full-time job versus being able to spend time in the Word? If Pastor Ulysses had to work a full-time job, he wouldn't be able to make his trips to the Dominican Republic to our churches there. He wouldn't be able to travel to Haiti. He wouldn't be able to, to travel to Sri Lanka. And there's so many other places that he desires to. He wouldn't be able to do those things. And it's not about giving a man a paid vacation, not, not giving Pastor Taylor a paid vacation to go and visit. No, it's they're, they're ministering because every time they go, you know, we see the fruit of their labor. You know, we see churches established, we see leadership established, and that's what they go to do. Amen. 
and I'm going to leave it with a final scripture in Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark 12:42. And this is for perspective. Jesus sat against the treasury and beheld how how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast much in. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which is a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor woman hath cast more in than all they that cast money into the treasury. For they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even her living. And that's the blessing that God gives us. Because even if we give it all, if God gives it to us, God has more. If God gives it to us, he, he can make it up. If God says, you know, if I, if I get my whole paycheck, and, you know, I'm, and I've never tried this, so I'm, I'm just kind of using it as an example. But if, I draw, if God said give the whole paycheck, God's got more. Well, he's never done that, but I'm just making an extreme example. That would be a scary thing. That, 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 that would cause me a lot of prayer, a lot of time on my knees. But whatever it is God gives, get, and whatever God requires, God has, has more in reserve. God, God gave, us, gave it to us, and he'll give us more. I love working with this ministry. I thank you all, and I look forward to, to, to seeing more and more as we as we grow, as we not just grow in number, as we grow in, in our spiritual walk, as we grow in the things God has given us to to see the things that that, that God's going to do. And you, know, you saw me. I sat down before I, I preached, and and I don't get to do that very often. And, and the times that I get to sit there. I'm sitting on my hands because I still want to direct the band. I still want to. I still want to do things, but it's about watching people grow. And, and as much as I, I don't like to be away from this place, sometimes I have to go somewhere. I have to make trips. I have to do family things. And the growth that happens when I'm not here, I could get. Re- I could get. I could get stingy with that. I could say, "No, I was supposed to do that." No. When, when we teach people, when you teach people, when you show people how to do what you can do, when you let people do your job, when you, let peop- when you mentor people to bring them up so they can develop their gifts, then you get to watch other people grow. Because that's not reserved just to the pastors. We, we all have, have the ability to mentor somebody. We all have the ability to raise people up. We have the, all, all have the ability to teach somebody. Maybe something small, maybe something big. We have the ability to encourage somebody. And then sit back and watch, and and, and kind of learn help, learn the lesson that I, I'm I'm trying to learn is sit back and sit on my hands sometimes and let people do things because that that's that's one of the things that, that's part of growth and that's not micromanaging and it's easy to do. And I know I said I'm wrapping up the message, but I'm gonna throw another topic, one more little piece in here, and that's when we say developing what we can do. And that goes with developing what other people can do. How many different groups do we have in our ministry? We've got our seniors ministry. We've got our youth ministry. You know, that's the young kids and then the teens. We've got those that do the yard maintenance. We've got those that, those that do the, the audio visual, you know, the sound system, you know, to making sure we can have the videos that we can put out online, those that serve in the kitchen. You doing your job is part of that. You doing, you teaching someone else to do that job is also part of giving back to God. I could keep going on a rant on this because it's something I'm, I'm kind of passionate about. I, and, I, and I just, I'll just leave it as an encouragement to do this. If you're in one of those areas, transition from I want to serve everyone to I want to teach someone else. Because we can serve everyone that walks in our door we could make them feel comfortable and make them feel welcome. And we could, you know, it, I, I'll give an example. This is one example. And it's just an easy one to picture. You're going through the serving line. You know, sometimes we have food in the back. We have a meal. It's, it, it's much more preferable, preferable that I, I want to serve. I want to be the one serving somebody. I want to be there on the line, putting the food on their plate, give a smile, encouraging somebody. I want to be the one to serve. How much more letting someone come alongside you and serve? How much more teaching someone else to serve? How much more to, to let that, that go to somebody else? Because now, not only have you ministered to somebody, you've served people, but now 
you've helped someone else. You've let someone be a part of your ministry. Even bigger than that, you've given someone else their own ministry. How do you do that? By mentoring somebody, teaching somebody, letting, letting someone else work with you. Or if someone wants to do something, let them do it. We have people that come in here that are fairly new and they want to do something, let them do it. Help them to do it. I, I know it's easier to do something yourself. I find myself in the same trap. I'm just as bad as anybody else. It's easier to, all right, I know this needs to go over here, and if I ask someone else to do it, it's going to take twice as long. Anybody been there? But if I teach someone else how to do it a couple times, then I don't have to do it anymore. Then, and it's not about me being lazy, it's because now I can do something else. Now I can learn something else. I've got this other thing over here that I've wanted to pick up and run with. I've wanted to study this. I want to teach this. I want to do this. I want to learn this thing. And I don't have to do this anymore because someone else got, got a blessing, got to do it too. You're going to get me wound up here. It's because I'm passionate about ministry. I'm passionate about seeing people being able to give back. People be, you know, you say, you know, I, I said I don't like to ask for money, but I do like to ask people to do things. I like to see people do things. I like to see people grow. So we'll wind it back up with, you know, our spirit of giving, giving back to God, giving back of our increase, giving back of our talents, giving back of our time. Thank you.